On behalf of my wife and myself, I would like to say thank you to Mrs. Lindsay and to all the faculty and the other workers here at Christ for the Nations for the wonderful welcome that you've given us and for the privilege of ministering to the students here and to all those that have come. We shall carry away a warm memory of our fellowship with you and we'll be praying that God will continue to bless you. I have a real love for young people myself and I love teaching. I think he got this too close. Now, I have in my pocket my sermon outline, but I'm not going to use it. Some while back I decided that preachers spent so much time ministering to people's needs that we hardly ever got out of the area of need and God's people were left need-centered and floundering in their own need. So I decided that ruthlessly and regardless of all the needs that might be present, I would begin to teach as if people didn't have need and as if they were capable of doing the things that God expects Christians to do. Uh, while we live in the depths of our own need, we obviously cannot minister to the need of the world. I've often compared the church to a lifeboat launched to save the survivors from a ship that has sunk. But by the time the lifeboat reached the scene of the wreck, it had sprung so many leaks that out of the twelve men on board, eleven were kept busy bailing. And one man every now and then was able to find time to reach over and grab some poor sinking, struggling seaman and get him into the boat. But the moment he got into the boat, they set him bailing with the rest. Now that is not how God intended the church to be. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to all good works. If you are going to abound to all good works, it really is necessary that you have all sufficiency in all things, that you're not continually in need yourself. So this week I have tried to minister not on the basis of our needs, but on the basis of our responsibility to God and man. However, this afternoon I felt that God prompted me, I trust I rightly understood his prompting, to speak about various areas of need that people do have. And at the end of the service, I am going to be willing to pray for the sick. However, the praying for the sick will be an after service and we'll make a brief break between the teaching and the praying so that those who do not have needs and do not wish to stay for the prayer for the sick may leave. Before I pray for the sick, it will be necessary for me to give some further explanation of what I intend to do, but we'll leave that till later. I want to speak to you now about, uh, on the basis of experience. Let me say I am not a doctor. As a matter of fact, I'm not a doctor of any kind. My academic qualifications were different, and we won't bother to explain them. Certainly I'm not a physician, nor am I a psychologist, nor am I a psychiatrist. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and a teacher of the Word of God, and my ministry is based on the Word of God, faith in Jesus Christ, and experience. And let's not leave out experience. It's good to have theology and theory, but it's much better when it works. And uh, if it doesn't work, it isn't from God. So I'm going to speak this afternoon on the basis of what I've learned, especially in the last ten years, in ministering to people in desperate need. Spiritual need, mental need, emotional need, and physical need. 
And I'd like to take just as an introductory text to make what I say respectable, because everybody knows a preacher ought to begin with a text. So I'm beginning with Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. Matthew 3, 10. These are the words of John the Baptist, and in a sense, they introduce the dispensation of the gospel. John was Christ's forerunner, and he was a kind of transitional figure between the law and the prophets and the gospel. And uh, one of the opening words of this verse is the word now. And I believe, in a sense, it expresses God's intention through the gospel. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's a very radical statement. How many of you know the real meaning of the word radical? Well, it comes from the Latin word radix, which means root. So that which is radical is that which goes to the root. And the gospel is totally radical. It goes to the root of things. It doesn't mess around with something higher up, but the axe is laid to the root. In my personal experience over the last ten years, and I can say just about ten or eleven years, I came to grips in a new way with people's problems. And it was on the basis of helping them to receive deliverance from evil spirits. And looking back, I realized that I began with the branches and the top branches, the thinnest, smallest branches. And I had some success in getting rid of branches out of people's lives. But then I realized that there were thick branches below those branches which still had to be dealt with. And when I got down to the thick branches, then I realized that those thick branches were supported by a trunk which had to be dealt with. And then when I got to the trunk, I realized that the trunk was supported by invisible roots and that the only final way of dealing with a tree is to get rid of its roots. Just recently we had a very heavy wind in Fort Lauderdale where I live and one of the trees in our yard was blown over. And because I wasn't very much interested in a tree, in it as a tree, I decided to get rid of it. And it was a Saturday, there was no one around to help me, so I got rid of the tree by myself. It wasn't a very big tree, but I had to cut off the branches and then saw off the trunk, and then I was left with the stump and the roots. And I tried to pull the stump out, I couldn't do it, so I realized I'd have to remove each root. So I went around digging under the stump with a saw and sawing off each root. And I discovered the root structure was very complicated. Some of the roots went under and back again in a circle, and some were intertwined with others. And all the time I was thinking, I was doing this, I was thinking, that's just like the problems of the people I deal with. Down below the surface, and most people like to keep it right out of sight, are the real deep roots of human problems. And they're complicated and they're involved and you have to get to them one by one and cut them all. And sometimes one root will protect another root. So I'm going to talk to you about roots. And I'm just speaking on the basis of personal experience. I don't offer you any seminary background. It's good to have one, but I don't have one. Most of my real learning of the things of God was done in the British Army, when I spent five and a half years, three years in desert. And that was where I really was able to get to grips with the Word of God. Dealing with problems, I've come to realize that the deepest roots go back into people's past. They go back into preceding generations. 
Some people, especially kind of the evangelical fundamentalist type, don't like to face this fact. But in many cases, our lives are the product of what our ancestors were and what they thought and said and did. And I've learnt the truth that's in the 20th chapter of Exodus. God says, if people make any other gods before him, he will visit those sins unto the third and fourth generation. Now it is not every type of sin, as I understand it, that's visited to the third and fourth generation, but it's the sins that involve making other gods before the true God. And I have to testify on the basis of experience those sins regularly are visited to the third and fourth generation. And I'm learning more and more that when people have problems that can't be dealt with on the basis of the simple ministry of believe in Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, we have to look behind it and we have to go down below the surface to look for the roots. I've discovered by experience that a curse is a very real thing. The Bible has a great deal to say about curses. And one thing it says is, the curse causeless shall not come. If a curse comes, it comes because of a cause. I might as well illustrate this right now so that you get some idea of what I'm talking about. About just over a year ago, I was ministering in a Presbyterian church in St. Louis, and I taught on deliverance, and then we went down to the basement of the church for the deliverance service. And I was teaching and ministering, and two rows from me, in the second row, I saw what appeared to be a family, father, mother, and daughter. The daughter was apparently a teenager, and very conspicuously she had her left leg in a cast from the thigh right down to the bottom of the foot. I didn't know them, but as I stood there, I had a very strong impression that the family was under a curse. So I just spoke to the father and I said, I have the impression that your family is under a curse. Would you like me to pray and release you from that curse? And he said, yes. So standing there and not touching any member of the family, I took authority in the name of Jesus and released that family from the curse. And I have to say objectively, though I did not touch one member of the family at that time, there was a noticeable physical reaction in each member of the family as I broke the curse. Something happened that was physically visible. Then I learned that the girl had broken her leg, I think, three times in 18 months, the same leg. And that the doctor had said it no longer would set, infection had set in, it could not heal, and it would have to be amputated. After having released them from the curse, I offered to pray for the girl's leg. Because it was in a cast, there was no possibility of any kind of visible evidence of healing, but I took the leg, raised it in my hands, prayed over it, and said, I believe God has touched your leg. They went back to the hospital, had further x-ray, discovered that the wound had healed, and she was out of the cast within a few weeks. As far as I know, I heard from the father about a year later, her leg is totally healed. Now, I do not believe that healing would ever have taken place if I had not previously broken the curse over the family. And I think we run into the one cause why sometimes we seem to minister and do all the right things, and yet there's no result. Now, let me say there are certain things that I consider as evidence of a curse over a person or over a family. And one thing, which is very characteristic of this case, is the accident-prone person. The person who's always having unnatural accidents. And I think of a member of my family who's now dead. Clever, able, gifted man. And yet the number of automobile accidents he had was unnatural. 
apart from other things. He'd step on a pair of scissors, it would go up to his feet. If there was a deadly bug around, be sure it would get him. And really, I have to say he's with the Lord now. He died of cancer. Very close member of my family. Looking back, I come to the conclusion that we failed to save him physically because we failed to deal with the root cause. Now, his mother was Jewish and she was a spiritist. And furthermore, I'll have to say he hated his mother. And looking back, I see that the evil influence from the spiritist mother was never fully cancelled in that case. He was saved, baptized in the spirit, served the Lord as a missionary for seven years. And yet, there was a dark shadow over that life that was never lifted. Let me say this while I'm about it, and I'm not bringing you an ordered discourse today. I'm just speaking as things come to my mind. The first commandment with promise is this. Honor thy father and mother, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now God means exactly what he says, and I'm totally convinced that if a person does not honor his father and mother, it never will be well with him, no matter how long he may live. He may be a saved believer, he may be a servant of God, but if he does not honor his father and mother, it never will be truly well with him all his days. I know a man who's going to be working with us shortly in a quite responsible capacity in ministry, who realized this, and realized that he'd hated and despised his father and that there was a dark shadow over his life. And he did something which I'm not saying is necessary to do, but he took a journey of about 1,500 miles to the cemetery where his father was buried. And leaving his wife outside the cemetery, he went and knelt by that grave and for about two hours he emptied his heart of all his bitterness and resentment and rebellion, walked out of that place knowing that his attitude toward his dead father was right. And his wife said, she has a different husband. I remember dealing with a young man when I first came into this ministry. It was in a Pentecostal church in Seattle. He came to me, he was about 22 years old, newly saved and baptized in the Spirit. Now, this could make you smile, but on the other hand, it's serious. He was earnestly seeking to serve the Lord and walk with God. He was in love with a young woman who was a Pentecostal girl, a good Christian girl. They were planning to get married, but at times he would become so insanely angry with her that he would actually be on the verge of throttling her. Well, as I say, you can smile at that, but when I sat with him in the pastor's office and began to talk to him, he began to use the word fixation. So I said, on the basis of that, I said, now tell me, you've been to a psychiatrist, haven't you? And he said, yes. Well, I said, I, I want to tell you, I operate on a different basis. I'm not criticizing the psychiatrist. I respect what he does. But I said, he operates on a psychological basis. I operate on a spiritual basis. Now, I said, you can have your choice. But I said, I'm probably cheaper. <laughs> so, he said, I'll choose you. <laughs> well, then... I felt the Lord prompting me. I don't know, I sometimes have a word of knowledge, but mostly it comes with me in the way that I'm, I'm led to ask the right question. And sometimes I know for sure I'm getting question by question, exactly laying bare the roots. So I said, did you have an unhappy home background? He said, yes. I said, was your home divided? He said, yes. I said, your father was against your mother? He said, yes. And I said, whose side were you on? And he said, my mother. And he, I said, was your father sometimes unkind and brutal towards you? And he said, yes. 
And I said, have you ever forgiven your father? And he said, well, he's dead. I said, that doesn't make any difference. Because it's not for your father's sake you forgive him, it's for yours. As long as you have unforgiveness in your heart towards your father, you're bound to him. You can never be free. So it was getting late, it was about midnight, and after talking for him for a while, I said, I want to lead you in a prayer. And I led him in a prayer of confession of faith in Jesus Christ, renunciation of sin, and a claim for deliverance. Now, in my prayer, I wanted to say, I intended to say, and I forgive my father, put those words in his mouth. But I forgot. My mind was getting a little tired. So when he came to the end of the prayer, he himself spontaneously said, and I forgive my father as I would have God forgive me. And when I put my hand on him and prayed for him, two fixations left him. <laughs> so, you understand, <laughs> the two persons you are most closely related to in life are your father and mother. Now, everybody here has a father and a mother. Some people here don't have a wife, don't have a husband, don't have a brother, don't have a sister, maybe don't have a friend. But there's not one person here that didn't have a father or a mother. And you were physically the product of them. And there's a relationship between you and them which is real, it's acknowledged by Scripture, and it's a vital part of your life. First and foremost, if you are in bitterness, resentment, rebellion against your parents, no matter whether you're 20 years old or 50 years old, you'll never have it well with you. So if you want it well with you, you better decide to change this afternoon. You say, well, it was my parents' fault. I say, I can believe that. It always is. There are no juvenile delinquents. There are only adult delinquents. They produce juvenile delinquents. Always it's the parents' fault. What can a little unborn or newly born baby have to say about them? But it may be that in the background of your family there are dark forces which you do not understand. It may be that your mother or your grandmother was a fortune teller, a clairvoyant, spiritist, Christian science practitioner. Now those things are what are meant in Exodus 20 by having other gods. There are other sources of spiritual help to which people go. The source to which you go for spiritual help is your God. If you go to drugs for spiritual help, then drugs become your God. I knew a woman once, in fact I still know her today. A friend of mine was ministering to her deliverance. I was not present. And the spirit that was plaguing her and binding her, named itself as the spirit of sleep, which is a biblical name, the spirit of deep slumber. And the man who was ministering to her commanded the spirit to come out of her in the name of Jesus. And it said, I won't. I'm her salvation. Wasn't that an extraordinary thing to say? But as I medit on, meditated on it, I, I saw the truth of it, in a sense. When that woman couldn't face life, you know what she did? She curled up and went to sleep for 16 hours at a stretch. Sleep was her salvation. It was her substitute for God. Now people have many, many substitutes. Nicotine, alcohol, drugs, the television, many other things to which we turn for help, for comfort, for strength, and when we do, we make those things our God. But the worst and the most serious is when we turn to some form of occult power or practitioner, like a fortune teller, a clairvoyant, a palm reader, a person who practices ESP or hypnosis or handwriting analysis or a host of other things. We're agreed about that, aren't we? Yeah. There's a young lady in the front row who had a very strong disagreement with me some years back about the rights and wrongs of handwriting analysis. So I let the Lord deal with her about that and she came round to my point of view. 
But I think she would tell you, if you asked her, that she'd have done better to agree quicker. Almost any form of supernatural knowledge is very, very dangerous. There are only two sources of supernatural knowledge. One is God, the other is the devil. If it doesn't come from God, it does come from the devil. If it comes from God, it comes through Jesus Christ. Because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if we come to God the Father, it's through Jesus Christ. If we get into any other supernatural realm of visions or revelations or knowledge or prediction, and we didn't go by Jesus Christ, we got into the realm of evil and of Satan. And in a certain sense, we have tied ourselves to false gods. We need to repent. We need to revoke the claim that they have over us. And we need to loose ourselves from their dark, evil influence. And as I say, the experience may not be in your life. It may be in the life of your parents, your grandparents, or your great-grandparents. In relationship to the occult, to witchcraft, to fortune-telling, to divination, to sorcery, I've observed that there are certain lines that follow. It usually goes through the female line, most often. Sometimes it will skip a generation. And you'll find that a grandmother who is a fortune-teller or a clairvoyant is liable to have one favorite grandchild. And it's usually a girl. And that favorite grandchild will be the recipient of that evil supernatural power. My personal experience is that children born of parents in the occult, who are practicing the occult, are frequently born with the occult spirit in them, from birth. Spirit of divination. A spirit of witchcraft. Let me try to describe to you divination as I understand it. Divination is essentially the predictive ability. You can predict certain things that are going to happen. It's very real. The 16th chapter of Acts, there was a young woman who had a spirit of divination. King James says, the Greek says, a spirit, a python. A python, you know, is a kind of snake that coils itself around the body of its victim. And it's very significant in the original versions of Jean Dixon's story, A Gift of Prophecy, it's related specifically out of our own lips that her peculiar gift came to her in the form of a snake which came into the bed with her, curled itself around her. That's left out of the later editions, but it's there. Nothing to a person who knows the Bible could more clearly advertise the source of that gift. I was in New England about eight years ago speaking to groups of people under the auspices of the Full Gospel of Businessmen Scholarship, and in every place I was talking about the baptism of the Spirit and leading people into the baptism. And in most places I would get a group of 15 or 20 people, and they'd come forward and practically every person would receive the baptism. Well, there was one woman who followed me around from place to place about four times, and every time she came for the baptism, she didn't receive it. So she came up at the end and she said, what's the matter with me? I, she said, I come up, I say the same prayer as the other people, I don't get it. And I'd noticed her, she stood there like wood. When everybody else was being moved by the Spirit, she was unmoved. I said, um, do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the only way to God? She said, no. I said, that's why you don't get it. Then she began to tell me, what was really a very tragic story. She said, I read the book, A Gift of Prophecy. And she said, I decided I wanted it. So she said, I asked whatever gods there might be for that gift. And she said, after that, I began to know things that were going to happen. Now, I'm paraphrasing what she said, I'm summing it up. But in essence, everything she foreknew was evil, was disastrous. For instance, she saw in a dream her aunt dying by drowning, and her aunt died by drowning, exactly as she dreamed it. But she could do nothing about it. 
And then she was under a sense of guilt and condemnation that she had done nothing about her aunt, though she knew she was going to drown. Let me tell you that if God reveals things to you, there's always a practical and a redemptive purpose. And basically, God does not reveal horror to you. The devil is the one who reveals horror. And his revelations will serve no practical purpose. They'll simply enslave you. Well, I ministered to that woman. In fact, I was due to preach and I spent about 45 minutes when I was getting ready to preach trying to help her. I could not get her out of what she was in. And I left that scene with a heavy heart, a sense of almost hopelessness in the face of this evil power that she had submitted to voluntarily, but in ignorance. 